I'm a convert to Reformed theology. Perhaps some of the problems you might experience tonight are the result of it, that I not really grew up as a Reformed person, that it is not in my very blood, but every part of Reformed theology in my life has been battled for, thought through, discussed, um, but it has also certain advantages. And when in 1985, as a very young boy, I just had done my PhD in missiology in Kampen, so-called Odestrat, the school that does not exist any longer or has merged with, with Amsterdam now. And um, for the first time ever, I came to the conclusion that all the bits and pieces where I had changed my original theology people from the outside would call reformed. I have to say, with my experience with reformed people, I promised myself, I would even say I promised God, that two things never would happen. Number one, I already, within the World Evangelical Alliance, was a heavy part of the world mission movement. 1984, we just had succeeded in listing all people groups, all ethnic groups, all language groups in the world where there still is no local indigenous church that can go on with mission. And in all those circles, rarely a reformed person was around. Some said, I belong to a Presbyterian church, but I knew when approaching them, they could not really tell me why. And I promised myself, if I ever have to take the decision between world mission and belonging to the reform camp, I will choose world mission. I have to say, Sam Logan didn't edit at that time, reform means missional. And a um, lot of things have happened since then, but that at that time was my impression. The reform people in the main were missing in the worldwide uprise of Christian churches. And number two, I already was heavily involved, that has been the heart of all my life, with the persecuted church. And all my ecumenical relations stem from this. I do not know Pope Francis because I was eager to have pictures with our enemy. Well, you know what I mean. Um, uh, have, have, have those pictures, or I will tell in a minute, how this gets you in the middle of the mess, the media, etc. But I wanted to talk with everybody possible on the topic of persecution of Christians, either because I visited churches that were blown up. And the Archbishop of Nepal, whom I visited, whose, whose church just built for the first time under religious freedom, a nice wooden church, was blown up and five, five girls were killed. And I visited him. And he told me, that's my experience for the first time, many, many years ago, how is it that only evangelicals come along and visit me? And my own superior never has been here to look after his flock. All my ecumenical relations come from this, and I promised myself if I ever have to choose between belonging to the reform camp and standing up for the persecuted church, I will choose the persecuted church. That sounds dramatic. Things have changed. I no longer have to choose. But this is where I come from. And I ask you a little bit to give me a little freedom when I criticize our own camp. I've edited the German version of the Westminster Confession. I could go on with certain things. I mean, in Germany, I'm seen as the enfant terrible of uh, Bible-believing reformed people. Um, so that is not, not the question, but whenever I criticize our own camp, which is my family today, please give me a little freedom with this, with this uh, background. Well, as I said, things are changed. We even now have a new man from Brazil. After the Catholic Church got an Argentinian Pope, World Reform Fellowship thought we have to compete with this. And... Uh, and so we are very glad, and I want to take this opportunity, David, to really, um, well, I want to dedicate my lecture to you, because I think that the World Reform Fellowship somehow is small, but the ideas behind it are very, very big. And I will speak tonight 
also, when criticizing us about the fact the world leaders are longing for the things we have to offer. And I hope that you can play a major part in this, that all those good ideas are not stuck in the US, yeah, but really get to every nation in the world. So all my criticism is historic because it doesn't touch the World Reform Fellowship any longer. Let me start with some experiences. Several days ago, I met the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch who was visiting our president and Mrs. Merkel together with the Coptic Pope and some other patriarchs um, because beside all the strange things that are happening here in Wittenberg and elsewhere by the mainline Lutheran churches, they had the idea that it would be nice if those old Oriental churches would get to know something about Protestantism. So they invited them, and uh, because they really don't know how to uh, relate to those people, uh, they invited me because I'm close friends with all of those guys. We also had the Catholicos, which is the patriarch of the Syrian Orthodox Church in India. My Indian friends here uh, will know him with the nice term. All those patriarchs have the name Ma Toma. Yeah, and so uh, I, I have a good standing with them, with the name Thomas, who they think brought the gospel to their in India. And their stuff. And we got into the discussion, how is it possible, what do we do with those peoples who young guys, young boys and girls who go to the Middle East to kill other people, other Muslims, other Christians, more or less everybody, and often act like animals. They slaughter Christians like they slaughter animals. So they hang them upside down. Now, I, I'm not going into the details. They say they behave like animals. They make us into animals. Can this ever be forgiven? Can they ever go back to a normal life? Because many after a year are totally disappointed and return. And my wife, um, on, with the permission of the government, is working with those guys in prison to understand what is going on. And I said, well, if you are not offended and see this not as me evangelizing you, I have to tell you very frank, and I can tell this as a sociology of religion, no man can get out of this those people, even if they do not kill anyone any longer, will live a broken life for the rest of their life. This happened after the second, after Hitler. We had many, many Germans who virtually forgot what they did and never came over it. They could not remember what it was, but they never got forgiveness. And I said, we have, meanwhile, hundreds, probably more than a thousand biographies out of people who came out of this and became happy people. And all of them converted to our Lord Jesus Christ and preached forgiveness. I said, I even do not need to preach as an evangelist, just as a sociologist of religion. I have to say, this seems to be the only way back into a normal life. Because it's so utter evil what you have done, that you cannot live with it. And then I preached about Paul, not about justification. I should have done it because they came here to, uh, for the celebrations. Yeah, I said, Paul is the example to the whole world. And I preach this, I say I preach it, I lecture this. Just did it in Fort Lauderdale on the International Congress on Religious Freedom. That Paul is the example how to come out of fundamentalism, radicalism. Because he killed people. Just because they had a different faith and he used the state for it. And he used the church for it. Any permission he could, would get, could get. And it's very open in, 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 in the book of Acts, how he's standing there and is happy about Stephen being killed. And then he becomes a Christian. Already our total topic involved 
Why are you persecuting me? Is Jesus asking him. Which is a full of theology already. By persecuting the Christians, he actually persecuted Jesus. And they are persecuted because they are followers of Jesus. And interestingly, Paul never blamed the Jews on it. He never said, well, it's because I was a Jew. Jews are fundamentalists, you know. Jews have the tension to become violent. This is, it was not, I'm sorry, now I'm a Christian, I'm a nice guy. He blamed it on his sin. He blamed it on himself, misusing the name of God to kill God's people. And he warned the church again and again, I'm not going into details, but he warned the church again and again, if you stand, beware that you do not fall. He did not give, and all his life, every night you have the impression, he remembered what he had done and would praise the grace of God that he had forgiven him and would say, I'm the least of the sinner, the last person I would have chosen to become an apostle is what Paul says, would be me. No, it's the other way around. God chose him on purpose. And it is not only a private conversion. More than ever before, it is the message, if you want to get out of the role that you as a human being take the place of God, and you may, you may kill people, you may judge people, you, whatever, only Jesus can get you out of this forgive you what you have done and get you to the place where you understand that we are just a human being living by the grace of God. But remember, I'm telling all this to the top leaders of the Syrian Orthodox Church that are, to be frank, totally lost in what is going on there. They are persecuted, they are killed, and most of their members really don't know what's happening. And after that, it goes to the media, of course. I find a blog by my reformed friends, not very important ones, not your blogs. Nevertheless, the debate is there. Are those old oriental churches Christian churches at all? Are not, after all, they monophysites and believe in the wrong Jesus? Does Thomas give not the impression as if this would be churches and that people would die for Jesus? Friends, friends, I mean, study your church history. Even the Catholic Church, meanwhile, has understood that we ran into a problem of how to translate Old Syrian into Latin and Greek, Coptic language into Latin and, and Greek. And if you thoroughly do your, your, your translation work again, you find out that all those splits for 1,800 years were about politics and that they lived and died for the same Jesus as we do, who, has, who is one and two. Let's not fight about how you call the one. We call there is one person. Okay, I mean, but that's, that's, that's a Greek work. And there's one nature. Again, that's not, not the biblical term for it. It's not what Jesus said about himself. Yeah? But isn't that amazing? You are in the middle of this whole topic, what happens in the Middle East, and friends have time. I'm, I'm a systematic theologian, don't misunderstand me. But before you put out such a judgment, please take your time to study the documents, the history, before you bring the judgment which you probably have learned in seminary or found in a dictionary. I visit the Grand Mufti of Lahore. All Grand Muftis in Pakistan are not the nice guys. Why did I visit him? Three times this man stopped a mob that was there with fire and wanted to burn the Christian quarter of Pakistan. And this man stood in the street and said, this is against the will of God. I know this from Christian witnesses. The third time that happened, he even said they wanted to go on because they were used for him, to him stopping this. So they marched on and he said, if you want to kill the Christians, you have to kill me first. I mean, friends, the book of Acts praises Roman 
officers that protected Christians, why in the world should I not thank a grand mufti in Pakistan with all the problems there? We did not know whether we would have five or ten minutes. I have the privilege with my bishop's cross. I always run around with a cross. So when the media are there, whatever it happens, even if I have no time to talk to them, it's evangelism already in, in the media. Yeah? Well, we ended up, my wife and I, with four and a half hours with him. And each hour, this became more personal. Then a bomb exploded in a police station. And he thought it was him. He has more than 100 soldiers and policemen guarding him. And I asked him, are you aware that this is what you have produced? Now you are shocked because it hits yourself. But you saw, you, 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 you started all of this. You taught this. He has 100,000 people in his mosque on many Fridays, 100,000 people. And he is the nicest guy of all those guys in Pakistan. Otherwise, he would not have met me. I come out. The churches in Pakistan are very, very happy that leaders come along and thank those guys for it. I come out. Again, the blocks. Ah, you would think at the end that today is the night of block bashing. OK. My friends saying, how in the world could you meet those people? Don't you know what he stands for, what he is? Yeah. Um, what about the Christians did you not, in, in the country that, I mean, the Christians were the ones that wanted me to come. Those guys have no connection with the persecuted church. But they are sure we never should shake hands. Friends, I mean, I don't want to clap me, don't misunderstand me, but how should this grand movie ever find Jesus if people like me do not go? They will not listen to normal churchgoers in Pakistan. They even have a problem meeting them because they are immediately killed, but they can meet people from abroad that come as state visitors, etc., etc. And I can tell you, in four and a half hours, if you are together with four and a half hours with me, uh, afterwards, you will know what the gospel is about. My wife always says it's like an old toilet. There comes the point where Thomas, pshht, you know those toilets with all the water, yeah? You pull, and then all the water comes in one. She always says she's always waiting for this moment where it makes this, and everybody is wet. The Pope's most loved Protestant, one of the results is that I'm invited by the strangest Catholic groups around the world. I just spent two days with 300 Catholic chaplains from all over Europe that met here in Berlin. Um, two years ago, I was the first Protestant ever speaking to them, the first evangelical. Now they invited me again. That's like here. To, in my position to be invited doesn't mean anything. There are so many people looking. Whom do we invite this time? Ah, oh, we didn't have so and so. If you are re-invited, that means something. So I spoke at the last General Assembly and the last time. And so to be re-invited tells me, ah, OK. Yeah. So last time I had a very easy topic. So this time I can choose a little more difficult topic. Um, 300 Catholic chaplains. And one of the questions really is, when you are there, and for them, of course, religion, state, religious freedom, violence, it's in the air for chaplains, yeah? is why are evangelicals so peaceful? I mean, we are not really peaceful, but we never kill people. Yeah? We write blogs and stuff like this, and books, and split but we don't kill each other. No, that's, that's a joke, of course. Um, why, why it's so peaceful? And how do you manage to make your young people peaceful and yet deeply convicted of the religion? They say, we either have people that have no real conviction and then they don't care, or we have people that are, have real conviction and they tend to become extremists. I mean, do you think in a situation like this, you can bypass the gospel? And I'm speaking about the gospel according to, oh no, not according to Matthew Mark, uh, well, the way we see it. Um, 
I put out a blog myself. I have a nice blog. After the Reformation year was opened a year ago, and you perhaps know that it was opened by the Lutheran World Fellowship in the Cathedral of Sweden, big thing with the king and everything. But the Pope was not only a guest there, but he opened it together with the Lutheran World Fellowship. And if there's mess and chaos like this, I'm always around. My interest it was they had invited a lot of people from the Eastern traditions and old Oriental churches who, of course, are on neither side. It was the first time ever we had a large inroad into the Orthodox churches discussing the whole matters of justification, etc., etc., with which, as you know, have bypassed them for a long time. But now we have global churches everywhere, and the Orthodox churches are no longer fixed to certain countries, but they are spread over, all over the place. And I put out in my blog that what the Pope said in his sermon was much closer to what Luther, Luther meant and what Calvin meant than anything all those liberal Lutheran bishops, archbishops said. For them, it was a jubilee of their great guy. I mean, the Mennonites, I'm not the Mennonite by theologian. But the Mennonites are not so happy if we praise Luther and all those guys. Yeah? Um, yet a Mennonite can have a biblical view of the gospel, of course. Yeah? And um, it, it was really tradition. It was, oh, what good all has this brought to the world? And then the Pope came and he said, Luther had a very simple message, and it is too small to say that it was only of salvation. It's true for everything. God always comes first. Before we can do anything good, God always needs to do something. I mean, I know that this is the private opinion of the Pope. I know that there are still about 40,217 and 11 pages to be changed if this becomes the official teaching of the church. But isn't that shocking that those people who are paid for being Lutherans do not want to offend anybody? What strange times that the Pope, why can the Pope do this? Today, I published an article in our major newspaper, an interview for the Reformation, uh, uh, here in, in Germany for the Reformation Jubilee, um, on the Pope in which I claimed, number one, that we are back 500 years ago, actually 502 years ago. Because for the first time, the Pope wants to kill corruption. And if there would have been no corruption in Rome and no political games at Rome in 1515, when Luther said it's the most corrupt place in the world and the Vatican is interested in money, in power, and in girls, yeah? Um, if this would not have been the case, if this would been, have been a severe theological discussion, the Reformation, I wouldn't say, would not have taken place. The Pope only did win the whole thing because in the Council of Trent, he assured that no German theologian from Germany, I mean, no Catholic theologian, no bishop would attend the Council. Otherwise, he was not sure whether he would not lose. I mean, theologically, we easily would have won. But it was a power game. It was a war, and it was corruption, corruption, corruption. Now the Pope comes and says, the Curia is the most sinful and corrupt place in the world. We are setting back. I don't say it has changed already, but we are going back to the place, and that is my experience. For the first time in his history, we really start to discuss theology. And that Pope Francis is so open-minded that you just come along is because he no longer is the king of the Vatican or the king of the Catholic Church, the, the middle age king which you only um, may talk to after you have paid something and bribed someone and, and kissed his ring and so on. Ending up in a huge, and this time it is, includes members of the World Reform Fellowship, which really, I mean, it really struck me with the argument that I'm no longer reformed, that I have given up on the reformed gospel, and that I've changed to a theology by experience. 
You know what we actually discussed with the Pope at that time? And I have evidence because I was not alone. In Sri Lanka, a cardinal calls the government to put a law through the parliament against the Protestants. And in Sri Lanka, that means the evangelicals. Not against the Catholics. Yeah? In the middle of a situation in which between the Buddhists killing the Hindus, the Christians are somewhere in between, and they're totally lost. The Catholic cardinal tries to save his side. Three days after our lawyers had gotten 19 Catholic nuns out of prison, three days later, he calls for a law against us. Against the will of all the Catholic bishops of the Catholic Bishops' Conference. So I went to the Pope, I spoke with him and said, this has to stop if you mean what you say. And he actually stopped it. I was standing up there for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Sri Lanka, and it's not fun to live in Sri Lanka. The Buddhist government is against you, the Buddhism is against you, the Hindus do not like you, and then you realize, well, I cannot say the Catholics. 19 other bishops were of different opinion. The only problem is they were not the chair of the bishops' conference. It stopped. And we end up in a discussion whether I'm still reformed just for the pure fact that I speak to the Pope. There's no other evidence. I mean, I did not give you my book on indulgences to prove that I'm a good anti-Catholic. Yeah? Um, I have a book in the market if you don't think that I'm right uh, against indulgences. Um, heavily debated in the Vatican, but yet probably the most nasty book on soteriology of the, Catholic, of the present Catholic Church. It's actual, including Pope Francis. Um, and, um, uh, well, I exchanged reformed convictions for the theology of experience. Friends, leaders of the present age are lost more than ever. Whether it's the American presidents, not only one, the presidents, our leaders here in Berlin, the political leaders, your presidents, um, they even do not know what they want for themselves. Even in corruption, they are chaotic. But what they want for the country, I mean, they don't know where to go. And here in Europe, every covenant has its own way to talk about Islam. And in the end, they all only talk about it. The things that happen, happen by themselves. They do not control it. Um, the religious leaders are lost. I could tell you the whole evening stories of in, on our, our interface relations with Muslim leaders, etc. They are totally lost. They go on traditionally with certain things and no, it does not work. The religious, the Christian leaders are lost. Still under Pope Benedict, the World Evangelical Alliance was invited to the Synod on Evangelism. We got 10 minutes to speak about <laughs> evangelism and evangelical view. And just to show you that we are not compromising, we said e being an evangelical comes from the evangel, the gospel. So if preaching the gospel is not what is first of all on your heart, you should not call yourself an evangelical. But how do we know the gospel? We know it only from holy scriptures which are the supreme authority in the church and for every matter of dogma and ethics. The Pope sitting three meters away. But I'm not telling you this, but I will tell you the reaction Pope Benedict from the deepest of his heart said when we spoke about that evangelism, first of all, is just witness that every believer speaks about his faith and that this is what makes the evangelical movement big, that we have so many people, not Billy Graham, yeah? I mean, all the people that become Christians and became Christians were brought by simple believers who had taught about them first, rare exceptions. It was this personal witness, and then that was a good moment to catch them. Um, 
it is this personal um, witness and Pope Francis, from the deepest of his heart, I wished it would be so easy. If you read his Jesus book, it is so easy. You think everything is there. But to be frank, what do you do if you are the Pope? Then there was a discussion on it, and Cardinal Schönborn from Vienna was the first to speak, and he said, whenever we want to do real evangelism and get our people to witness, it is either hierarchy or sacramentalism or both that kills it. My reaction? I know that this is not exactly word by word from Luther, but exactly, it's exactly what Luther has been talk, talking about. They know it. And we have to tell them. And if not we, who else? They only will listen to theologians. And I don't know what God in his sovereignty does with all of this, but we have to tell them. And again, I come out only to find the famous blog that the Pope is the Antichrist and that I shook the hand of the Antichrist. Well, to be frank, if it would have been the Antichrist, I would have evangelized him because I don't see nothing in the New Testament that this is forbidden. Jesus, in the last minute, one second before Judas betrayed him, said, someone will betray me and gave him the last chance to turn around. Can I argue with him and tell him that by this he um, stood up in favor of what Judas was going to do? No. Jesus did the same with Paul. Last minute gave him the chance. And he became not only a Christian, but humanly speaking, the most important witness of the first century. You see, what has all to do this experience to do with our topic? God's son as martyr by persecution and suffering need to return to the center of theology of dogma. Because for me personally, all this is, uh, experience with the reaction are combined in the one experience that mission and the persecuted church do not play a role. It is pure dogma magisterium, whether it's right or not. The question was, is the Syrian Orthodox Church a church? The matter is, you see, for me meeting the Pope, I'm open to any discussion. I know it's a delicate topic, but it's just an ethical question whether we may meet him. It has nothing to do with the question what I believe and what he believes. And there are others, of course, who meet him. As always when we meet other people, evangelism mission is always people to meet people who are not like-minded. This is our task. And some of them are small and some of them are big. And if you single out the Pope and say you may not meet him, you accept that the Pope is the one very special man on the, on, on the earth. But that makes always a difference. For me, it's just a very influential church leader, like the ecumenical patriarch, like the patriarchs in the Near East. The Holy Spirit in John 16, 16 and 26 is called the comforter. So when Jesus introduces the Holy Spirit, you understand what I mean? I mean, he was there when he took his office, and uh, of course he was there always, when the, but when Jesus introduced the important role of the Holy Spirit to his apostle and to the church for its whole history, he introduced him as the comforter. But friends, he did not say that if you invest in, in the stock and you lose something, then the Holy Spirit is your comforter and tells you next time you will win again. He is the comforter in persecution. Why do I not read this in most all evangelical, even reformed books? I blame the others too, when they speak about the Trinity. 
all the details about the Holy Spirit. In most of the big books, no mistake, he was introduced first of all as our comforter in persecution. Earlier already Jesus had said to the apostle, whenever you go to court, don't care. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. Millions and millions and millions of Christians have experienced this. It's still true today. The book of Acts tells all those stories and therefore tells us the sermons we have in the book of Acts are all sermons to, law, to, to the judges and are seen obviously as, well, let me say, the most brilliant sermons preached at that time. But why were they so brilliant? I mean, each time we are told that it was the Holy Spirit who spoke to those. And before, Pete, before Stephen preached his sermon, he saw, he saw Jesus on the throne and he was filled by the Holy Spirit. And then he spoke, why do I not see this, read this in our systematic theologies? Is this irrelevant if you speak about who the Holy Spirit is? If Jesus says in John 16 that even is the reason why he sends him? Why is this so? That very clear biblical things are not found in many of our systematic theologies and very often, we are no exception. Well, there is a real, real, how to say, I mean, contradiction. That on the one side, we have to say the large percentage of Bible-believing Christians today, call them evangelicals or not, I don't care, no longer live in prosperity or legal security, but under severe persecutions. That has become the standard. And we know that even in the West, I'm not going into this, but even in the West, the nice time is over. So-called secular governments go after us because of all kinds of um, moral topics. And at the same time, we really lack a theology of martyrdom. It's some specialists speaking about persecution that write nice, book, nice books, but we lack the systematic theology of martyrdom. Oops. If you think, okay, Bible, 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 I believe in Calvin. I had this lady, a French lady, she came to me and said, I have to write my thesis, do you have a nice topic? I said, okay, if you're French speaking, there are still thousands of letters by Calvin in French that never have been used to look for his theology of this and this. And you know that I'm interested in the persecution of Christian suffering, so why not? You can read them, read all those letters, and look for Calvin's theology of suffering. She, did, she, she wrote a brilliant book, which we published in German, sorry. And she chose the title, a quote from Calvin, Strolling at the Edge of the Grave. Isn't that fantastic? Fantastic. This is our Christian life, strolling at the edge of the grave. We live on the edge of the grave, not only because we can die any time, but because the devil is out there, he says, who wants to see us dead. And we are strolling. We are not crawling. We are strolling there and witnessing that we do not fear the grave because Jesus Christ has overcome the death. Fantastic. Again, I don't say that this is not out in literature about Calvin here and there, but it is not really the DNA of our books on Calvin. 
we report in his life how much this Luther, I could say the same, the whole Reformation and the topic of persecution more or less is living. And you know that in the mighty fortress is our God. Paul uh, Luther says, let them take the house, the children, the wife, and the life. We have Jesus. And this is not something you say lightly. But for Luther himself, that was not only his experience, that was his deepest conviction that the theology of the cross includes that the cross can become very real, that other people, because you believe in Jesus, because you believe in the gospel, take everything of you, including your life. This is the hidden topic in Lutheran studies. It's there some, from time to time. But I can tell you I've written many essays on the Theologia Crucis, which did not mention persecution. What is the cross about? What is the cross other than Jesus is the martyr by definition? Who f and the martyr is the witness because he witnessed to the Father. He witnessed to the gospel. He witnessed to the world that it needs forgiveness. They killed him. State and public religion alike. Back to the Bible. We have trivialized many verses. There are very strange examples how to do this. Um, I skip a little bit. We should be the salt of the earth. All books are written on this verse. If you read the following verses, to be the salt of the earth means to be willing to die for your faith. This is how why the salt disappears and yet leaves something in this world. What we make out of it is a nice version of the social gospel, yeah, that we have to change this world to the good. I don't say that if we are not killed, we still do a lot of good for this world. I'm not, I'm a reformed. I want to change this world to God's will, wherever possible. But we have made this verse into a nice political verse and is talking about death. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Ah, that is a good reform verse, isn't it? He is the author and also the finisher. It's deep reformed conviction. The only problem is that it goes on to talk about being killed and says, blessed are they who are persecuted for the righteousness, for this is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you if men shall revile you or persecute you and shall say a manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake rejoice and exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. It is of course also talking about what we make in systematic theology out of it. I'm not saying we misuse the verse, but we get, forget the deepness of the verse, that it goes down to he is the author and the finisher of our faith, even if very easily it can mean that we die and it looks as if he has not achieved anything. Why? Because it's exactly what happened with Jesus. The world thought it, has, it did win, and it was the biggest victory ever over the devil. And this is what we are for. Very often God uses us just as an example that weak pe big people like us can really make a difference, but often he shows this by letting us die. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Oh, what a nice discipling verse. Well, it includes a little bit of denial, which means to fast from time to time, to eat a little less and all those things. We don't should live in luxury. How does it go on? Take up his cross and follow me, because whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. I could go on for hours. Bible verses that are used I don't say wrongly, but they are trivialized because you do not mention they are talking about life and death. And we have to tell 
it, you might say it's easy for me as a German uh, to say this, but we have to teach everybody that becomes a Christian that becoming a Christian includes the willingness to die for Jesus. When I was born, when I grew up, there was no sign of it. But my parents have lived in the situation where this was the case. While I was living nicely here, here at the very place, was persecution by the communists, yeah, um, in, in the former communist Germany for many decades. And it can come any minute. Look around in the world. You cannot guarantee that in five years things have not changed and stupid politicians think that going against us might help them to win the next election. I, as I said, um, only um, if you look into the Bible, only three books of the Bible do not specifically mention persecution. Um, four books were written especially to encourage persecuted Christians. It is the most present topic in the writings of Jesus, Paul, Peter, and John. Um, First Timothy, Peter, and Revelation only circle around the topic of um, uh, persecution. The book of Acts only contains two chapters, which is not about persecution and Christians dying. Paul's entire missionary practice and theology involves this. I could all go on and on and on. This is the request to us. I'm deeply convinced, not being confessional, not being proud, not saying, I'm glad that I'm not like the others. I'm reformed and the others are, yeah? That is so unreformed, so anti-reformed. I thank you that I'm not like the others. But I'm deeply convinced that um, the reformed movement is the one that comes closest, please listen carefully, to the idea of having the Bible only. This has a bad result. If we become liberal and do not longer have the Bible, we have nothing left. Everything is gone. Yeah? It's a little simple if I say, well, the Lutherans still have their bishops and their liturgy, and the Anglicans still have their mice. You see, I mean, it's a little. Uh, you understand what I want to say. Yeah? The reformed are really in danger. If they give up the Bible, nothing is left. Even their confessions do not say much, because they only say it's the Bible alone. And if you cut this out, there's not much left. We have so many different confessions, and we have then no clue. Is it the Belgium? Is it the Swiss? Is it the, I don't know, yeah? Um, how was it possible that we became part of this forgetting persecution stating that we really only want the Bible and that we want to preach from the Bible only. What happened to all the sermons that should have preached on texts that include persecution? And the topic was not taken up. I would say every second text you choose from the Bible to preach about should lead to a prayer for the persecuted church in your, ser in, in, in your service. No other chance. What happened? Number one, of course, liberal theology. I knew it. It's liberal theology. Of course, it's no question. And I could go in detail with a lot of time. Um, if you, of course, go into the history of dating of biblical books, you will find out that all the books that have a heavy involvement with persecution have been invented much later. That starts with the Old Testament. The book that is the most false one is the book of Daniel. Yeah? It really was put back centuries. In reality, it was written oh, centuries later. Of course, there is no much, not much comfort in how God helped his people, his prophets in persecution, if this all did not happen. The verses of Jesus around persecution were number one verses by Bultmann and all our friends to be said not being from Jesus, but coming from later times when there were persecution and Christians tried to put this into them. Okay, liberal theology, let's forget this. We surely did not forget about persecution because we are liberals. Except some of you are very 
are liberal deep in their heart and don't know that story. Yeah? Well, that was not our reason. Then, of course, we have things like the prosperity gospel, which has a lot of problems to include a theologia theology crucis and say the DNA of Christianity is losing. Friends, the prophet in Islam is always winning. That is the sign of the prophet that he has the victory in the end. And we have a book that says every prophet was, well, he could choose, head off, burned, cut, killed, tortured. Uh, you had a free choose which way you wanted to die. But this is what Hebrew says. It's the mark of a big prophet that in the end he dies. And that Jesus is a prophet is proved by the fact that he was killed. And the apostles all were killed because they were not only apostles, but dealt into it. They were not only apostles, but they also were prophets. Prophets lose in the end. Yeah? So the chance, if, if you stand up in public for the gospel, the chance rises that you are a prophet and you will be killed. This is the mark of Christianity. And just talking about the prophets, you had all the difference between Christianity and Islam. You don't need to talk about God or anything else. All is in capture here. But again, I doubt whether the reformed community had this problem mainly because deep in our heart we teach the prosperity gospel. Of course, there's a major uh, reason that evangelicalism for a long time has been American evangelism, evangelicalism. That um, American, that was the counterpart to European liberal churches. It was the strong evangelical churches that helped evangelicalism to survive. And it is no question that without, say, the huge crusades of Billy Graham all over the world, we wouldn't have something like the World Evangelical Alliance today. He gathered a lot of people around the gospel in all countries in the world. Whatever you think about his theology and what he did, it's the pure fact that without the US, a lot of those things. What would we do without the, 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 the evangelical seminaries in the US with the professors there, all the good things they wrote, all the, all the books they publish, etc., etc. Yet, obviously, the Americans thought that everybody lives as good as they do. Not everybody, there are exceptions, yeah? but too many. Um, somehow, in all this mix, we have fallen into the trap ourselves. And we need to get out of it, and therefore we come to the very center of what I say. You cannot talk about the Trinity, you cannot talk about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. If you not on every page mention the fact that the Son of God died for our sin on the cross, and it meant he was martyred. <clears throat> and that the center of Christianity is not only witness, but witness with the willingness to die for this witness. We are glad that most Christians do not experience this, at least now. Not today. But this is what it means. This is the double meaning of the martyr, who is, as you know, the word, meaning of the word is the martyr, is the witness, and yet it always includes the possibility. Why is this so? I could go on, on for hours looking in the New Testament. It is because the world hates Jesus, but Jesus is not around, we are around. So the world hates us. My wife, dealing with Islam and, and politics, all these things around, she always says, my private proof of the existence of the Christian God and of the rightfulness of Christianity is that everybody hates us. I don't need any other proof. Yeah? The guys, ladies and gentlemen, we in many countries are the most peaceful people existing. And we are the, often the most hated people, just for nothing. Why? Because you have chosen the wrong party. 
We have chosen the party of Jesus. If the world does not hate us or behind the world hating him, the New Testament is very open, very clear, very frank. The reason is because the devil hates us. And again, he cannot kill Jesus again, but he can kill us. And again and again makes the mistake he made when Jesus died, thinking that this is a victory and it is a loss. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And this is happening worldwide. In Iran, we in our education systems have about pastors with churches of 500,000 people that come to those churches in the underground. And this is not all existing church. My personal guess would be that there are more, in the moment something between one million and one and a half million underground Christians in Iran. And they live on the edge of the grave. Often they fly to Germany or other countries, but the vast of the people stay there. This is the growing church in places where this is verbatim what the New Testament says. If you witness, you can die. Um, so finally, the New Testament tells us that Jesus is the archetype of the martyr. In 2011, I was involved in something that stirred up a lot of heavy discussions. The Vatican, the Catholic Church, the World Council of Churches and the World Evangelical Alliance signed a document with the title Christian Witness in a Multi-Religious World. The first sentence is, mission is the very essence of the church. Every believer is obliged to witness to the salvation he found in Jesus Christ. I mean, to be frank, to me, this sounds very evangelical. Yeah, I still, to be frank, do not know why the other signed this. I don't say that we always do what we state there, but this is our DNA. But the other signed it. So we have it now very officially that Christianity is about mission. Mission is the very essence of the church. And we can tell the others, don't criticize us for mission. This is the very essence of the church. But I got into an international debate that on purpose we have bypassed in the document evangelical language. Yes, we did. And we did it on purpose. But friends, we said, witness. Is there something more biblical than witness? The translation of the martyr? Is there not something, is there something less evangelical and reformed DNA than to say every believer is obliged to witness to the salvation he found in Jesus Christ? Because this is more than to preach it. You can preach it and not have it. You can say that's the right thing, but I don't care. Witness is you have to speak about that this very gospel is not only the truth, but changed your own life. It's always two topics. And then the chance goes up that people hate you for it. So Jesus is the archetype of the, wit of the martyr. That has been there in the theology of the first centuries of the church fathers all the time. Number two. If you want all the Bible verses, I can give it to you, but I just put out the propositions. Because of this, Jesus is the actual object of all perse per persecution existing. To kill us actually means they try to kill Jesus again and again. This is what it means. And Jesus has told this very clear to his disciple. If they wanted to kill me, if they want to kill me, they will kill you. If they hate me, they hate you. If they persecute me, they will hurt you. And he says exactly the same he did. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Stephen said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they do. Why? Because he knew that he is standing in Jesus' place now and experienced the very same. And we have the command to do the same again and again to the Islamists saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Have mercy 
draw them to you. This is the only political solution we have worldwide. To make a compromise with Islamists is very difficult. Yeah? Would you be willing to kill only half of the people and perhaps next year only one third and then we gradually, I'm joking of course, yeah? But we have the strongest force against them in existence, praying for their conversion. And look in the New Testament. Constantly the church has been praying for the people that persecuted them. And Paul again is an example and a beginning of a long history of major people persecuting us that God by his grace made to apostles and missionaries. And to be frank, I like to use this as a very example that the reformed gospel is right. Because it's so obvious that those people did not become Christians because they liked Christianity and had thought about it for a long time. They were evil and they hated Christianity and the next day they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. The suffering of the Christian is distinctive because it continues Christ's sufferings. This is a difficult thing in theology. I wrote a whole book against Pope John Paul II, who quoted Paul's verse that in his sufferings, he would fulfill the suffering of Jesus. Why? Again, the trivialization. Pope John Paul II was thinking about his illness, his suffering as an old man. Paul speaks about death and martyrdom as, as fulfilling the suffering of Christ. That's two different topics. Yeah? And he is speaking about what every Christian experiences when he dies. Not about the one man, the Pope, but Pope John Paul II was convinced that his suffering was a blessing to the world. This is not what he's talking about. It's talking about persecution and death. Jesus' martyrdom makes him our role model how we relate to persecution. He did not search it. He did not produce it. He did not like it. He even several times did not go to Jerusalem because he knew they would kill him and his time had not come. So even to fleeing persecution is not necessarily a wrong thing until the moment where he knew the Holy Spirit told him that it is his time now. And this is what we experience worldwide. People fleeing persecution, it's not wrong in itself and others knowing it's my time to stand up. Jesus is our role model how to relate to persecution on a practical thing. And last not least, theology, the theology of the cross is only complete if it for us it is not only a soteriological topic to discuss with people that think otherwise. otherwise. It is the DNA of our dogma. You cannot understand what it means that God is our father, the head of the Trinity, without speaking about him willing to let his son suffer and die. You obviously cannot speak about who Jesus is. And the whole matter of the two natures of course, it relates directly to the cross. The Son of God dying not like but as a human being. What a strange story. But you cannot tell who he is. You cannot tell who the Holy Spirit is. You cannot tell what salvation is without mentioning persecution. And I could go on. You cannot define what the church is. Read Calvin what the church is. To be frank, when the Lutherans say, first of all in their confessions, I know in reality it's a bit different, uh, the first interest is, is the pastor ordained and are the sacraments 
ordained the right way. That was not the world of Calvin. They were persecuted in France. Each time they would celebrate the Lord's Supper, the police could come in and kill them, or at least arrest them. And there was no pastor around. So the question was, are we allowed to do the Lord's Supper even if we are killed because it's illegal what we do? This is how it started. No wonder that this whole topic wanders through everything he says about the church. The church is those people who are in communion with Jesus Christ and meet with him and because they have chosen to be in union with Jesus Christ, they have taken on them the cross which includes they are willing to witness and to die for this as our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm begging us not only to produce the theology of martyrdom or to bring the topic back or preach more often. I think it's time to bring it back to the very center of our dogma that from now on, whenever we speak about the central topics of our dogma, when we speak about justification, we cannot speak about justification without, not, without mentioning that the price for it was the death of Jesus. I mean, that's obvious. And this, this includes that we might be justified in heaven, but unjustified here and seen as the evil guys and put into prison or killed. Amen.